The following is a presentation of Be Well, a multiple media health information project presented by WVIZ PBS, IdeaStream. Funding comes from the Dr. Donald J. Goodman and Ruth Weber Goodman Philanthropic Fund of the Cleveland Foundation, the Margaret Clark Morgan Foundation, the McGregor Foundation, and the Community Foundation of Lorain County. Additional support comes from the Mount Sinai Healthcare Foundation, the St. Luke's Foundation, the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated, the Faro Foundation, and RPM International Incorporated. Hold your right arm up to the count of 10. From the emergency room to the operating table, our locally produced series, Be Well, helps you and your family better understand common diseases and life-saving technologies. Follow local patients through tragedy and triumph. See science simplified and treatments demystified. Learn what it takes to be well. Next, be well, kids and diabetes. Hello, I'm Rick Jackson. Welcome to Be Well, Kids and Diabetes. It's hard to believe that a little over a decade ago, type two diabetes was virtually unheard of in children. Now, tens of thousands of children in the United States have this dangerous disorder. The spiraling number of youngsters with type 2 diabetes is closely tied to the childhood obesity epidemic. If children continue to eat all the wrong foods and exercise too little, some experts estimate that in the next 40 years, the number of kids with type 2 diabetes could quadruple. In this program, we're going to explore the dangers and issues behind the rapidly growing number of children with type 2 diabetes. But first, IdeaStream's Kay Colby helps us understand exactly what diabetes is. One way to understand diabetes is to trace the path of food as it's digested in the human body. The food you eat gets broken down to glucose, a form of sugar that serves as fuel to energize cells. The glucose travels into the bloodstream. Here's where an organ called the pancreas enters the picture. The pancreas is located behind the stomach and acts as a factory producing a hormone called insulin that helps the body use glucose. Immediately upon sensing glucose in the blood, the pancreas kicks into action, releasing insulin. Insulin is a protein hormone and is secreted and binds to a receptor that promotes the transport of glucose into the cell. It's very swift and it's very efficient. So this is the medical version of what happens. Pretty complex, huh? Well, we're gonna simplify it a bit with a trip to a hotel. We're going to the Wyndham in downtown Cleveland. So how about the fourth floor? Think of this hallway as a blood vessel. After you eat, glucose, fuel for cells, fills the hallway. Each door to each room represents a cell. But the glucose can't get into the cells by themselves. The pancreas knows this and releases insulin into the hallway, the bloodstream. The insulin unlocks the doors to the cells and glucose glides on through. It's like a lock and a key situation. It literally turns the key and allows the glucose into the cell. Diabetes is a disease that centers on problems with insulin. There are two main types of diabetes. Type 1 is usually diagnosed in childhood and is a disease in which the body turns against itself, destroying the ability of the pancreas to make insulin. It literally destroys the factory, burns it down. Factory is burnt down. There is no insulin production left. Type 1 diabetes accounts for 5 to 10 percent of all cases. In contrast, type 2 diabetes accounts for at least 90 percent of cases in this country. While type 2 diabetes occurs most often in adults, it can develop at any age. While the number of children with type 1 diabetes still outnumbers those with type 2, doctors are concerned about the rapidly growing rate of type 2 among children. The rise is closely tied to the obesity epidemic. Obesity makes the body less responsive to insulin. In type 2 diabetes, the body still makes insulin, but there are some problems with the pancreas, the body's insulin factory, that eventually cause it to burn out. At time of diagnosis, you've already lost 50% of your capacity to make insulin, and that gets worse over time. People with type 2 diabetes also have insulin resistance, which means the body does not properly use what insulin it does make. Remember the hotel hallway scene? Well, the insulin people are just not efficient at unlocking the doors to get the glucose guys inside. 
they literally can't unlock those receptors and get insulin action with normal levels of insulin. They need very, very high levels of insulin to achieve this. So if you have this problem and you also have a problem in your factory, you can't make enough insulin to overcome this, you're going to have high blood sugars. While the causes of type 1 and type 2 diabetes are different, the effect is the same. High levels of glucose sit in the blood vessels. One way to diagnose diabetes is to measure the amount of glucose in the blood after a person has not eaten for at least eight hours. Diabetes is diagnosed when the fasting blood glucose level is 126 milligrams per deciliter or higher and confirmed with a repeat test. A normal fasting glucose level is 100 milligrams per deciliter or less. Diabetes is really a disease about supply and demand. A healthy body requires a delicate balance between glucose and insulin. The key to managing diabetes is to try and keep that balance. Because where excess sugar sits, danger lurks. Now that we've explained what diabetes is, we're going to show you what it can do to the human body. This is a prosthetics lab, a place where artificial limbs are made. Diabetes is the number one disease-related cause of amputations of legs, feet, and toes in the country. Amputations and most other complications from diabetes are a result of excess glucose sitting in the blood vessels, which over time causes damage. Damage to large blood vessels can lead to heart attack, stroke, and poor circulation in the legs, which can result in gangrene and amputation. Diabetes also causes big problems in small blood vessels that feed the kidneys, eyes, and nerves in the hands and feet. Diabetes and high blood pressure are the leading causes of kidney failure in the United States. Diabetes is also the number one cause of blindness in adults below the age of 74. And diabetics are twice as likely as non-diabetics to have heart disease or a stroke. And here's the scary thing. Some of those debilitating, costly, and sometimes deadly consequences may strike earlier in people who get type 2 diabetes in childhood. A massive study funded by the National Institutes of Health called Treatment Options for Type 2 Diabetes in Adolescents and Youth, also known as the Today Study, involved almost 700 overweight and obese children with type 2 diabetes. It followed them for almost four years. Patients were from 15 locations around the country, including University Hospital's Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital in Cleveland. As we see in our next report, doctors are worried about what they found. I'm going to listen to your heart and your lungs, okay, and look at your eyes, or the back of your eyes. All right? All right. Okay. One thing doctors have learned is that type 2 diabetes in children is more aggressive than it is in adults. As somebody has diabetes and diabetes progresses, the ability of the pancreas to make more insulin slowly goes down. And so that's why you see adults with type 2 diabetes initially start on pills, but later they end up on insulin shots. That process, which is called beta cell failure, seems to be much faster in children. And that's an alarming issue. If you get diabetes, you will have to like shoot yourself with a needle and get pricked in your finger and like for like when you first start, it hurts. 11-year-old Briasia Brooks was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes eight months ago. Initially, she had to have insulin shots four times a day. Besides needing insulin sooner, children with type 2 diabetes are getting complications earlier. Doctors recently sounded the alarm in a collection of articles about the Today findings published in the journal Diabetes Care almost 14% of participants developed eye problems. At the end of the study period, one-third had high blood pressure. And the number of participants showing early signs of kidney disease almost tripled. Until recently, consequences like these typically didn't show up till years later in a diabetic's life. And the study showed despite treatment, risk factors for heart disease, like high levels of bad cholesterol, worsened over time. If a person has heart disease or kidney disease or uh, damage to the eyes, um, then they are likely to not live as long as they would have otherwise. So potentially, these young people with type 2 diabetes would end up having shorter lives, more complicated lives, 
and also sicker lives. I love you eating the green vegetables. You listed a lot that you like, so the celery would Reasha be a great Reasha Brooks choice. is determined to do everything she can to avoid complications. With help from a registered dietitian, Reasha and her family have learned to eat healthier, and Reasha is exercising. In eight months, she's lost 25 pounds. So I think you are on a very good path. But Briasia wants other children to know the best strategy is not to get diabetes in the first place. Type 2 diabetes in childhood is often preventable. You should really watch out, like exercise a lot, eat the right foods, because I learned the hard way. Take it seriously, your child's weight, the gain of weight which your kids eat, um, it's a very serious situation if you can prevent it do as much as you can to prevent it. In children with type 2 diabetes, the rate of complications is higher. It's a more aggressive form of disease. So we as pediatricians and pediatric endocrinologists have to focus on preventing diabetes. So preventing and treating obesity is the key to controlling this epidemic. One indication of how the face of diabetes has evolved stems from the fact that doctors actually had to change the names for the different types. Type 2 used to be called adult onset diabetes because children rarely got it. Type 1 was called juvenile diabetes because that was the only kind children got. Now, thanks mostly to the obesity epidemic, the entire landscape of diabetes is much different. Cleveland recently played host to the Cleveland Clinic Medical Innovation Summit, which was focused on obesity and metabolic disorders like diabetes. IdeaStream set up a mini studio to interview experts from around the world about bariatric surgery and other treatments for obesity and diabetes. IdeaStream's Kay Colby had the chance to sit down with one national expert for an in-depth discussion about type 2 diabetes. Hi, I'm Kay Colby with IdeaStream, and I'm here with John Brooks, CEO of the Jocelyn Diabetes Center, which is the world's largest diabetes research center, clinic, and education. True, true. Great. And you're based in Boston. We are, yeah. Academically affiliated with Harvard Medical School. That's correct. So I kind of want to start out, we have this epidemic of type 2 diabetes. Do you think people truly understand what type 2 diabetes is and what it can do to the body? No, I think it's a great question. So as it turns out, I think we're learning a lot about type 2, and I think your point is a good one. A lot of people don't fully understand type 2 diabetes, the genetic components associated with it. Obviously, there's environmental triggers. It's affected by lifestyle. It's affected by what people eat. And, you know, I think there's a lot more opportunity and need for education, making sure that people know this isn't just something that, you know, people can just kind of snap their fingers and decide they're going to get rid of. They may, in fact, have a strong genetic predisposition. We know there's differences in type 2 diabetes across different ethnic populations. So it tends to be a very complicated disease that actually needs more, uh, more understanding. So how do you explain it to people? Especially, we have kids getting it now. So if you were gonna explain it to a child, give me your explanation. Yeah, so I, I'd say, you know, one of the things is the fact that, you know, our bodies produce insulin, and insulin is what the cells use to take advantage of the glucose, the sugar, that is in our system. That's how the bodies operate. Problem is, as people get overweight, they have some of the problems associated with uh, pre-diabetes, the amount of insulin that the body needs keeps going up. The cells become resistant to using that insulin, and we have to keep compensating. Well, at some point in time, the body can't produce enough insulin, and then we start having higher levels of glucose. That leads to problems, that leads to complications. So it's really kind of a metabolic disorder that uh, unfortunately, you know, our systems try to keep up with, and then at some point in time, they just lose the race. And you said something about genetic uh, a predisposition to this. What is, is that different in type 2 diabetes that you're finding, and is this insulin resistance or not using insulin right could that be in your genes? Well, I think we know, yeah. I mean, there's a, a genetic component. So obviously our genes basically, you know, we're designed to basically make sure that we could process food. And, and in some ways there's a hypothesis that maybe many years ago, you know, we have this opportunity to make sure that our genes were programmed to allow us to put on calories, you know, in the good times. So we'd have calories to burn in the lean times. Problem is we don't have a lot of lean times anymore. So we may have this genetic predisposition to basically load on calories and you know those calories stay there. They keep proliferating, if you will. 
and then we're not moving around. We're not exactly, hunting for our right, food, right. so we're not. And we're seeing that really across the world. I mean, you look at China, 100 million people in China with diabetes. India, you know, close to 65 million. That's probably significantly underreported. The Middle East, one in three people in the Middle East with diabetes. So if you think of it, you go back maybe two or three generations, you know, we didn't see that type of diabetes. But we know as people move from the urban area, you know, into the urban areas, they change their food, they change their lifestyle. Now we're starting to see this whole proliferation, really a pandemic around type two. Well, here in America, we now have a lot of children being diagnosed with type two diabetes. And there was a recent study um, showing, it was released earlier this year, that uh, it may be more aggressive in a subset. It appears that some of these kids are getting some bad complications early. Well, I think that's true. And, and in fact, we know that some of these kids have actually been predisposed, you know, back when they were in their mother's womb. So in fact, the her health, the mother's health, what the mother was doing, especially if she was overweight, diabetic or pre-diabetic, that may be in fact preconditioning or in fact programming these kids to become diabetic as they get older. And sure enough, they become teenagers, they start putting on a lot of weight, they start having this insulin resistance. And, you know, the worry is in that population, uh, normally the first course of treatment for people with type 2 diabetes is a drug called metformin. Mm -hmm. uh, that actually tends to allow the pancreas uh, and the beta cells to produce more insulin. It doesn't seem to be that effective in this adolescent population. So there's an early worry right there that the usual course of treatment may not be effective and that's just going to make this a more challenging uh, disease in that population to solve. So do you think the subset that are seeing they're having more eye problems earlier, kidney problems earlier, cardiovascular, do you think the fetal programming where if the mother was obese and they had these cells programmed setting them up for that uh, obesity, you know, in adolescence, that could have something to do yeah, with no, it? Yeah, no, I mean, we're just starting to look at it, and I think people are starting to do some research on it, but there's some evidence that, again, this early, if you will, conditioning or this early basically programming uh, is in fact causing these problems to develop earlier. You know, we used to see type 2 diabetes, you know, happening when people are much older. Now for it to happen in the teenage years, uh, that's pretty worrisome. Well, and if they're having bad problems now, like eye problems, the kidney or whatever, what are they, what's going to happen in early adulthood? Well, I, I think we know it's not a very good picture because to your point, all of a sudden, the complications that we normally would think would develop much later in life, boy, if they're happening when these kids become older and they're in their 20s and 30s, we're putting a huge health burden not only on them, but on the nation. And frankly, that's just not acceptable. So research-wise, are there, are there enough treatments for these adolescents with type 2? Well, I think now that we're starting to see this proliferation, you know, I think we're encouraged to see some efforts by, you know, different groups in the country to try to get kids moving, which is important. I think we're seeing the school systems starting to be much more focused on the foods and the type of foods and the quality of foods that are being, uh, you know, delivered in the schools and prepared in the schools. So I think, you know, we're starting to see Fortunately, people waking up to the fact that, hey, we need to really get a hold of this because otherwise, you know, we're just going to cause this disease to skyrocket. And that's really one of the scary statistics. Right now, we have one in 10 Americans with diabetes. And, you know, if you follow some of the projections, unless we do something dramatic, they're saying by 2050, so a couple of generations down the road, one in three Americans with diabetes. I mean, that just can't be. So what is, why do some people get bad complications and others don't. Have they figured out, is it if your sugar stays too high or maybe your sugar stays too high and then goes low and right. spikes that yo-yo? Do we yeah, know? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, and again, we think some of it comes back to the genes. Uh, so we're actually developing biomarkers. We're trying to understand which patients seem to be the ones that are more likely to what we call be a fast progressor. You know, despite the fact they're trying to manage their diabetes, nonetheless, their genetic composition may cause them to develop these complications faster. So that's kind of an interesting area that we're starting to look at. And if we know that they have a greater risk, let's say, for eye disease, kidney disease, then we can work with their care team. Perhaps we need to be even far more aggressive in really helping them manage their disease. So the genetics may have a lot to do with why some people you know, have this, the, the, there's a difference in the right. complications. And we're also looking at, you know, this whole new area called the microbiome, fascinating area, which is the Your gut, gut <laughs> bacteria that live within us. We're starting to learn that may be how the brain and the gut communicate. Uh, that may be when we're getting signals saying I'm hungry, when in fact you aren't hungry. Uh, and we also know that it may be a site for inflammation. 
So some of the things that we've heard in the program here about bariatric surgery, we're now learning that essentially it's not just reducing the real estate, but it's changing that internal intestinal bacterial environment. And perhaps that uh, is giving us some insights into how, again, the gut bacteria drive inflammation, drive obesity, drive diabetes. Well, so the bariatric surgery would be positive if you're going to change your configuration inside, you're going to change your gut, which right. may help if you had a bad gut. Exactly, exactly. And we're starting to see in other areas, you know, people are starting to get more information about probiotics. We're starting to learn that, you know, what we eat and basically the environment that our, we live in and the type of antibiotics and other things that we put into our cells, how that may be changing or affecting uh, the propensity we have for type 2 diabetes. Well, thank you very much, John Brooks from the Jocelyn Diabetes Center. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Pleasure. As we just heard, one hot new research topic in diabetes focuses on genetic factors which can make people more susceptible to developing type 2 diabetes and perhaps more likely to suffer severe complications. Evidence is mounting about how obese women who get pregnant may unknowingly program their fetus to develop problems like childhood obesity and type 2 diabetes. Researchers believe this could be one important factor feeding the obesity epidemic. It literally has become a vicious cycle being passed from generation to generation. Some leading research in this field known as cellular programming is going on right here in Cleveland. Dr. Patrick Catalano is researching how cells in the developing fetus may get programmed by things like increased lipids, harmful fats in an obese pregnant woman's bloodstream, which in turn can make her baby susceptible to developing type 2 diabetes in childhood. What we think is that the environment that a woman who's overweight or obese has in her bloodstream, her nutrients in her bloodstream, her glucose, her sugar, her, her lipids, can affect the way that the fetus develops in the womb whether it's developing just by the amount of nutrients the fetus is exposed to or the hormones that the fetus is exposed to can affect many different regulatory functions. You're turning on and turning off certain genes by the environment that you're exposed to and part of that environment may be sugar, it may be insulin, it may be the lipids and this is where the research is going now on the molecular yes. level. Actually I have three samples from lean patients and three samples to, from obese patients to compare. Okay. And Dr. Uh, Catalano and his yeah, team yeah, are yeah, trying yeah, to figure yeah, out yeah, what exactly yeah, happens yeah, inside yeah, the bodies yeah, of yeah, lean yeah, versus yeah, obese yeah, pregnant yeah, women. Yeah, At Metro Health, some women delivering babies agreed to donate tissue. In one experiment, scientists grind up pieces of fat. So we're grinding up the fat tissue from lean and obese pregnant women uh, to obtain the genetic material uh, to see uh, which genes are turned on and which ones are turned off. In another experiment, researchers slice off slivers of placentas from lean and obese mothers. They keep them alive in an incubator and feed them substances that an obese woman has in her blood supply feeding the fetus to see how they respond. Basically, we're doing the experiments outside of the body, in vitro, in the dish, but we're trying to replicate conditions that women who are obese might have during pregnancy. Here in the lab, you're really putting together the underlying molecular pathways, what's going on scientifically, chemically in the body. Right. It can give us an idea and then what's the best way to treat it. If we're looking at issues related to sugar metabolism, well then we can focus on that. If we think it's related to fat metabolism, we can focus on that. But the best strategy is to prevent harmful cellular programming from happening in the first place. That calls for interventions to help obese women lose weight before they get pregnant and warning women not to gain too much weight during pregnancy. We'll, we'll Dr. Catalano says a woman's pre-pregnancy weight is key. That's because cellular programming starts early. In fact, a woman may not even know she's pregnant when it begins. How you program that placenta in the first few weeks of pregnancy may have an important outcome six, eight, nine months later. You don't see it till later, but it exists early. For years, pregnant women have been advised not to smoke or drink. Now it's time to add fat to the list. Over the last few years, we realized that smoking during pregnancy is not healthy. We know that drinking during pregnancy is not healthy. The next thing we want to realize is that getting to a good weight 
and good diet and exercise before and during pregnancy is also another health component to having a healthy baby as much as all of these other things combined. It's more subtle, but it, it really does have potential benefits, not only the short term, but we think in the long term relative to the problem of childhood obesity. We close with some sobering statistics. When it comes to adults with type 2 diabetes, Ohio ranks sixth in the country, and the problem is only going to get worse. According to the Centers for Disease Control, one in three children born in the U.S. in the year 2000 will likely develop diabetes sometime in his or her lifetime. Hispanic children and other minorities are most at risk. The cost associated with caring for the projected barrage of new diabetic patients is staggering. That's why experts are sounding the alarm for better prevention methods to help people lose weight and exercise more. This program about kids and diabetes is just one part of IdeaStream's ongoing multiple media health information series called Be Well. Obesity is such an important topic, we've devoted an entire year to bringing you radio, television, and web content that examines many of the different angles and issues surrounding the obesity epidemic. Go to health.ideastream.org for links to articles, studies, stories, and local resources, all designed to help you better understand obesity and how you and your family can live healthier lives. You'll also find a link to our partner, Net Wellness, a consumer information website from Case Western Reserve University, The Ohio State University, and the University of Cincinnati. All this and much more when you go to health.ideastream.org. Well, that's all the time we have for now. For all of my colleagues here at IdeaStream, I'm Rick Jackson, and of course, be well. This was a presentation of Be Well, a multiple media health information project presented by WVIZ PBS IdeaStream. Funding comes from the Dr. Donald J. Goodman and Ruth Weber Goodman Philanthropic Fund of the Cleveland Foundation, the Margaret Clark Morgan Foundation, the McGregor Foundation, and the Community Foundation of Lorain County. Additional support comes from the Mount Sinai Healthcare Foundation, the St. Luke's Foundation, the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated, the Faro Foundation, and RPM International Incorporated.